Mark chapter number 16. Sorry, I got Mark chapter number 16, the book of Mark, as me, we know uh, that have been here and uh, have heard many times us preaching and teaching on the Gospels, we know that uh, there is a powerful record of the life and the ministry of Jesus. The book of Mark is thought to have been uh, one of the first accounts of such uh, uh, expressions of Jesus' ministry. And what I love about this passage of Scripture in the book of Mark, chapter number 16, we're going to start at uh, verse number 15. Um, and we're going to head all the way down to the end of the passage. If you uh, are aware that part of what it means in the Pentecostal tradition, the tradition that really emphasizes the role of God's spirit to be at work in our lives, is that God is always open to doing things that would not necessarily be possible, things that expand your capacity, your understanding of what is uh, accessible, what is normal. You know, uh, in, in our earliest testimonies of the tradition, uh, we, we would hear all these amazing stories uh, on 1906 during the Azusa Street Revival. You would have uh, these folks and they would be gathering in rooms and buildings not larger than this. They would work all week long. They would they would they would work in in uh, in the cooking industry. They would work in the in the uh, the teaching uh, schools and doing all these these you know daily tasks. But around five, six, seven o'clock. They said they would literally leave their place of work, go home and get cleaned up, and they would show up into a small building on Azusa Street, and they would have prayer meetings. And these prayer meetings would literally last all through the night. And they would, they, they would be in the prayer meetings, and they would be reading Scripture, and they would, they would, they would uh, be worshiping God and singing these songs of Zion, as they say. And they, and they would literally be into the night, one, two, three in the morning. And people who were neighbors of this house, because this was a house, praise God, it wasn't a church, it was a house, they, they called the police, because they, and, the, and the reports in the L.A. Times would say, we are hearing these strange howling noises. <laughs> Somebody say amen. Howling noises, hooping and hollering. And, and there was one eyewitness account, I'm talking about 1906, eyewitness account, who would peek through the window, and they would see all of these human beings literally embracing and hugging one another, rolling on the floor in laughter, speaking in languages they did not understand. And that's how the Pentecostal folks early on began to be nicknamed Holy Rollers. Because they literally, they was rolling on the floor in embrace. They said that uh, in these Azusa early Pentecostal meetings, you would have black and white and, and Asian and Latino. You had international visit, uh, visitors from different countries all flying in to experience this outpouring of God's spirit. They used to put uh, wheelchairs on the, on the walls and canes on the walls. Why? Because some folks would get wheeled in in a wheelchair. But in the course of the Azusa Street prayer meeting and the outpour of the Spirit, they will walk out without the wheelchair. So they put the wheelchairs on the wall as a reminder to some folk to understand that this is what the power of God's Spirit can do. Folks will walk in with a cane and, and run out without the cane. They put the cane on the wall. They didn't believe in recycling like we do today, praise God. They said, no, we're going to leave some evidence behind. Why? Because there may be some other people who are going through some similar challenges and they can look all around and see that there is a living, breathing testimony of what God's spirit can do. How many of you know that we uh, are still living in such an age? We may not have wheelchairs hanging on the wall, but I believe there's somebody in who has a testimony of God healing your body. We may not have canes on the wall, but I believe we got a testimony of God doing something that science and your doctors could not fully explain. Amen. And I want you to appreciate, child of God, that when Jesus was leaving the earth, Jesus gave his disciples this expectation. Last week we talked a little bit about Luke and, and, and the way they were told to go and wait 
until they receive power from on high. Uh, I want to back up a little bit and look at what Jesus also put as a seed in the heart of his disciples around their expectation. Because if there's anything that Pentecost is always and also about, it is about God expand my expectation. And that's what we're going to talk about today. God, I expect more. Amen. Tell your neighbor, God, I expect more. All right, verse number 14 of Mark chapter number 16, the scripture says, Later, Jesus appeared to the eleven themselves. They were sitting at the table, and he upbraided them for their lack of faith and stubbornness because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. And Jesus says in verse number 15, Go into all the world, proclaim the good news to the whole creation, and the one who believes and is baptized will be saved, but the one who does not believe will be condemned. Verse number 17, this is some good language to help explain Expand your expectation. And these signs will accompany those who believe. By using my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes in their hands. And if they drink in the deadly thing, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. Oh, somebody holler, God, I expect more. Say that. Come on, God, I expect more. Now, child of God, what I want you to know is part of our task here as the Way Church, and even I would say generally uh, across Christendom, across the body of Christ, is to keep reminding you that even though we live in this fixed universe, this, this human experience, there is another way, there is another uh, reality, there is a spiritual part of your life that God wants to make vibrant as you walk through the course of this physical life. I was on a... a, 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 a uh, a, a Bible study last night with the Church of God in Christ, folks, and we were walking through the book of Leviticus, and I was doing some teaching there, and I was talking about how the Levitical priesthood, uh, you know, a lot of us don't read Leviticus, you know, or Numbers, amen, or Deuteronomy, amen, a little too, you know, legalistic, and, you know, trying to figure out what is, you know, not eating shrimp and wearing mixed wool, and it's like, what are they talking about? It's, you know, I, I like my wool, praise God. I like to mix it from time to time. I like my shrimp, amen, Mardi Gras spirit, amen, right out. I don't need all that, all that legalism in my life. Somebody say amen. amen. But what I, I was bringing out to them is part of what God was attempting to do through the Levitical priesthood was help these new, and, uh, these, this new emerging society coming out of 400 years of enslavement in someone else's social structure. God was inviting them to build a different way of life that allowed their worship in, in the temple to be congruent with their treatment of their neighbor. That God was interested in helping them craft a social life that would not be incongruent with their life of worship. And although some people believe, you know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy fell out the air altogether, neatly bound up in the good old King James Version, it just plopped into somebody's lap. <laughs> I want to let you know it didn't happen like that. Just like storks don't deliver babies. Somebody say amen, right? But what happened over the course of time, somebody say over the course of time, over the course of time, God continued to be invested in the life of Israel to help them over the course of 600 years or so develop and refine what does it mean to live in your own social context in a way that reflects your worship to God. And isn't it something that we are still today struggling to figure out that balance? That there are moments and times in our lives where we can divorce what it means to follow Jesus from what it means to actually treat your neighbor well. Right. And so part of what I want you to appreciate is that when we are attempting to lean into the kind of vitality of a spiritual walk with God, it ought not cause you to have tension with how you treat your neighbor. And I want you to know, child of God, you're going to need the Holy Ghost to treat your neighbor right. Uh-huh. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him, that's why I need the Holy Ghost. Amen. How, how many know, keep it real, you're going to need the Holy Ghost to treat yourself right? 
<laughs> I wish I could talk to somebody in here today. Amen. And, and some of our challenge is that we often are trying to both treat ourselves and our neighbor right in our own power, in our own capacity. I have found that I have the capacity to love a whole lot of folk. And then I have the lack of capacity to love a few folk. In my mind, it's a few. Amen. Maybe it's flipped. Maybe I have a, a whole uh, a little capacity to love a lot of folk and a, and a large capacity to love a few folk. Amen. How many know self-delusion is quite a challenge? <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. I was talking to someone yesterday when I was in D.C., and they were asking me, you know, uh, I, you know I used to be a Christian, and why, why is it that you think that, you know, a lot of Christians uh, can't understand the geopolitical nature of what's happening in the world? I said, well, in the scriptures, it does talk about the God of this world has blinded so many. And in our, you know, tradition, sometimes we view spiritual blindness as, you know, the, the blind spots around our individual sins. But how many of you know sometimes we have spiritual blindness around uh, social sins, around the ways in which our treatment of our neighbor, we don't even understand that we have self-deluded ourselves. All this past weekend, myself and, and Nyla, we were in Washington, D.C., and we were there with March for Our Lives. We were advocating for uh, gun violence prevention measures. Why? Because we don't believe that uh, schools and, 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 and supermarkets and neighborhoods and movies and shopping malls should, should have uh, weapons of war ringing bullets throughout every single compartment of our society. We can't do anything about it. We who live here in the Bay Area, here in this region, we know that there's been, I, I believe, as of this morning, I saw as I was landing 51 murders just in the city of Oakland. After we had cut the violence down by 50%, this pandemic has caused our violence to come roaring back. Why? Because we cut the programs and the funding that was literally helping us to be peacemakers in our, in our communities. And so now we got our, our churches back in the city of Oakland filled with the Holy Ghost and power walking in the neighborhoods at nighttime by themselves. Why? Because they believe that there's something about what God has placed in them, that they don't have to just spend their time inside the four walls of the church praying for a solution when God may have given you two feet. And that may be part of the solution. And that's why I love the passage here where it says these signs will accompany those who believe. I mean, the first question I got to ask you are, is, are you a believer? And what do you believe? Do you believe that the extent of the power of the Holy Spirit in your life is just to help you kind of have a nice little step on a Sunday? Uh-huh. Is it just a, enough for you to kind of slide through, you know, with your mask on because we're still in good COVID, you know, mitigation times? Is it just enough for you, amen, to, to have a nice worship experience? Is it just enough for you to be able to sing and preach and pray real loud? Or do you believe that there are other signs that will follow those who believe? I believe that there are some signs that God is trying to awaken in some of us. Some signs that will cause you to, as the scripture says, amen, cast out demons. Lord, have mercy. Amen. And when the last time you cast the devil out of something, amen. Amen. And I say something on purpose. Amen. Because a lot of us focus on the devil we can't or we can't see rather than the devil we can see every day. Amen. I, you know, we grow up, I discern you have a devil. Walk past, I discern. I discern. I discern you have a devil. And, and, and meanwhile, the devil is on display everywhere. And the question is, what are you, what are we willing to do to literally make sure that we are casting out the devil every day? The devil from our school systems, the devil from our justice systems, the devil from our health care systems, the devil that continues to afflict the soul and the body of God's people. I want you to know, child of God, that God has given you power, if you can believe it, to cast out the demons and the devils and the afflictors of our soul. And you don't have to wait for somebody else, for the preacher, the pastor, the minister to show up. But there's power that God has put in your hand. 
you ought to just wave your hand and say, I got some power. I got some power. I got some power to cast out the enemy. When the enemy shows up in my mind, I have the power to cast them out. When the enemy shows up in my family, I have the power to cast the enemy out. When the enemy shows up on my block or in my school, I have the power to cast the enemy out. And these signs shall follow you who believe. Again, I want to know what is the depth of our belief. Some folk used to tell us, oh, you'll never stop this. You'll never be able to impact that. I tell them that's fine if you believe that. But I have a level of faith and belief that goes beyond what my eyes can see. Lord, Lord, it's part of the role of the Holy Spirit is to help you to see those things that are not as though they are. God wants to give some of us some x-ray vision. God wants to give some of us some eyes that can see behind the the iron gates and, and the walls that have been set up because of trauma, because of disease, because of frustration. I want you to know God wants to give you some power. Somebody lift your hands and shout, power. This is the sign that will follow those who believe. And then they will speak with new tongues. Somebody holler, I got a new message. Come on, say it again. I got a new message. I got a new message that God is is calling you to proclaim and to speak out. And how many know that message is not going to be spoken through the language you already have? Uh Uh-huh, uh-huh. I mean, I love to speak in another tongue that is a worship language to God. Uh, I love in my own devotion to allow the spirit, amen, and the love and the emotional connection that I have with God to literally take control in the way we call it glossolalia, where you are literally, amen, your tongue gets loosed, as they say. Uh huh. And it says that you begin to speak in groanings and utterings uh, that only you and God can understand. Uh, do I have anybody that's ever had a little conversation with God? You started out praying in the tongue you knew, and then all of a sudden something happened to your mouth, and 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 you praying next to your neighbor. They don't know what you're talking about. Uh huh. But you know what you're talking about, uh, and God knows what you're talking about. How many ever had a talk with Jesus? that was so private and that was so intimate uh, that when you got done talking you said I can go on a little while longer Uh, I can go on a little while longer why because there's something that God spoke to my spirit Uh, the pastor couldn't say it like God just said it Uh, the missionary couldn't say it like God just said it Uh, the politician couldn't say it like God just said it Uh, but when God told me I can make it I got up from my knees, I got up off my chair, and I walked back into that circumstance and said, if God be for me, Lord, I feel a little preachy in here today. Uh, Somebody ought to holler, if God be for me, then who can be against me? But I got news for you. There are some some conversations you need to have with people in a language they can understand. So God gives you the tongues to talk in a language with him in a in an intimate relationship and conversation with him that no one can understand. But how many of you know God wants you to have a language, a translation of the good things that God is doing so others can understand it? Yes, there's some things that are happening in the world that God is looking for some translators. God's looking for uh, what, what's what's that? What's that? What's that? What's that program? You put it on your phone. Get Rosetta Stone. Uh huh. God's looking for some Rosetta Stones up in here. Right? God's looking for somebody who knows how to immediately translate uh, what hopelessness, uh, 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 what hope looks like to the hopeless. Uh, God's looking for somebody who can translate uh, what despair and joy, what joy looks like to those who are in despair. Uh, God's looking for a translator up in here. Uh, and that's why I love the passage when it says, You will speak with new tongues and new languages why because the language we have is not adequate enough i mean i want you to think uh, of the story in 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 the book of genesis i think it's chapter number nine where it talks about the tower of babel i don't know if any of you know that story 
man, I know we kind of got, you know, a lot of us who are kind of re-entering or, or coming to, the, to, the, to these narratives and stories of the biblical text for the first time. But I want you to know there's a story about Babel. And in this story, you find that there was so much unity be among the peoples of the earth. That the scripture says that they begin to build civilizations and they begin to build this tower, this monument that was attempting to reach up to the heavens. And the scripture says that as they began to, to build these, these, these monuments and these temples, that God the, the looked down and said, you know, this is becoming too much a, a exercise of their own power at the expense of their consciousness that there is a power greater than themselves. And so the scripture says that God literally confused their languages. Why? So their unity could not continue to be used as an occasion for hubris among their own selves and power. And how many of you know something is going on in the world right now where the confusion of languages is now having the opposite effect? That we are so unable to have conversations where we can understand what each other is saying that we now retreat into our corners and we think we know what each other is saying and are missing the whole point. And when we become so uh, threatened by a different language, a different tongue, a different understanding, rather than leaning in to learn more and be curious, we retreat with violence and defense. And I want you to know, child of God, that one thing the church has to become in this age is a bridge builder and not a relationship breaker. You and I must prioritize relationships with others versus uh, this kind of sectarian uh, way of life where we are only in relation with people who agree with everything we say. Now, this is hard for me because, you know, there's some folk out here I don't want to be in a relationship with at all. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You know, some of these folk, I know they're full of the devil, praise God, and I'm trying to get rid of the little devil I got in me. <laughs> we were at this event. We were at the March for Our Lives yesterday, and, and we're, we're getting ready to go on stage to speak, and a little guy ran up through, I don't know, we had about 50,000 people out there at the march, and some little fella ran up to the front of the, of the stage and jumped over the barricade. Now, I'm about 10 feet from this little fella, and, and you know, everybody's kind of scrambling and running, and I'm looking at him, and I said, I said, boy, what's wrong with you? <laughs> He's hollering, I am God. We need to remove guns. And I start walking towards him and people, Pastor Mike, Pastor Mike. And Nyla, she's like, Daddy. <laughs> and thank God the security people got to them before I did. <laughs> Somebody say amen. Because I was ready to lay on some hands. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 didn't, it, it didn't hurt that he was about that tall, praise God. So I felt like if I can't subdue this little old thing, man, I need to do my first works over again. I got a church over here today. There's some folk out here, amen, that, that, that you, you know you need a little power to, to, to understand where they're coming from. And I want you to know that that is your responsibility as a follower of Jesus. In an age where the Tower of Babel is having the now reverse effect. We often used to preach and teach that Pentecost was the resolution of the confusing of languages because it gave us now the ability to translate and make sense of it. What if God's given you that Rosetta Stone ministry so you can help translate, help people understand the good news and the language they can understand it in your family, on your job. In your marriage, with your children, at your school, God has given you a unique translator, translation to help folk understand that hope is not that far from them. Healing is not that far from them. Faith, salvation, strength 
and power is not that far from them. And then finally, child of God, it says that they will uh, pick up snakes in their hands. Now, you know, there are some folk in the Appalachian uh, uh, Mountains, a part of the Pentecostal tradition, where they literally, you know, would go find snakes. And they, they called them snake handlers. And they would pick up the snakes and they would let the snakes bite them. And they would, they would just believe that the venom is not going to harm them. I'm not asking you to do that in a literal sense. <laughs> amen. T -t Testing, amen. <laughs> Listen to me. Don't find you no know, real snakes. But how many of you know there are some snakes in your life? Mm-hmm. There's, there, there's some, there's some, there, there, there's some, 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 some creatures that are stalking your mind, your heart, your spirit. And I hear the word of the Lord being, being made plain to some of us today. That even when these snakes wiggle themselves into your life. The scripture says that it will not hurt you. It will not kill you. It will not create a deadly, lethal result. I want you to know, child of God, that following Jesus does not, it, it does not exclude you from being vulnerable to the attacks of the enemy. But when they come close, the scripture says they will not harm you. Why? This is my last point here. It says, because there will always be people around you that can lay their hands on the sick. And they will recover. How many know that healing is available for all who need it? Healing of the mind, healing of the body, healing of the soul, healing of the spirit. God, I expect more than my current condition. I expect more than what I have in my hands right now. I expect, God, a supernatural a supernatural outpouring of your spirit that literally impacts the way I speak. That impacts the external threats that are visiting me regularly. That helps my capacity to love and to offer healing to those who are in need. And if you can expect more, how many know God can do exceedingly and abundantly above all we can ask or think. Stand with me, everyone, and let's prepare ourselves for some time to pray. God, we expect more of you, more of your power, more of your strength, more of your spirit. And so, God, right now, I want you to lift your hands to the Lord, everyone. And I want you to ask the Lord to give you more of his power. I want you to ask the Spirit to pour out to you an excess of strength and anointing so there can be an expanded capacity for you to love yourself, for you to love others, for you to receive strength and anointing. I want you to believe. I want you to believe that there is more beyond just the experience of Sunday morning or the worship through singing or the listening of the word through preaching, but there is, listen, a intimate relationship that God wants to have with you. Not just so you can be in a space of isolation with God, but God wants to pour into you so then you can be in a position to be a blessing to others. God wants to heal you. So rather than us needing to have wheelchairs on the walls, you become the walking, living example of the healing power of God in the world. Rather than us needing to have relics as evidence on the inside of the building, God says, I want to heal and restore your mind. So as you leave to go out into the world, people who knew the broken you now see a whole you and say, if God did it for them, God can do it for me. Do you expect more? Come on, lift those hands. Say, God, I expect more. God, I expect more. God, I want more of you. 
So God, give me more. Give me more. Give us more. Give us more. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Come on, give the Lord a hand. Praise in this house today. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you. We thank you. Amen. God bless you. God bless you, people of the way. We love you so much. We thank God for you so much. Amen. We are just so blessed. Amen. To see the saints coming on back into the house of the Lord. Amen. We trickling on back in. God bless all you that are uh, watching online. Amen. We, we're just glad to have these moments and spaces where we can continue to gather in person and online. So as we become more comfortable and more freed up in our schedule, let's, let's keep gathering because I believe there's a blessing in the gathering. There's a blessing in the gathering.